All right. Recording is on. All right. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this weekly TSC call. This is a public call. Everybody is welcome to join and participate. There are a couple of requirements to doing so. You must be aware and live by the antitrust policy, the notice of which is being displayed if you're online. The other piece is the code of conduct. So please be aware and live by those. So we have a couple of agenda items. There's an announcement first. I don't know if it's Jessica is on, but she asked me to echo an email she sent out uh, a little while ago on the TSC list and a bunch of other lists as well. There is a marketing opportunity. Uh, the Hyperledger team is organizing webinars. So each project has the opportunity to put a webinar together. Uh, it can be of two different kinds. There is the one hour version or the 30 minute version, one being more uh, hands-on uh, demo kind of oriented. And so, there is a requirement for people to have the backup of a sponsor, as a, which has to be a maintainer of the project you intend to present for. But other than that, uh, it's a great opportunity to put educational material for your project out there and get the whole communication team of Hyperledger to socialize it through you know, social networks and the likes. So, uh, if you're ever interested, there's a form for you to go and fill out to get the process started to submit a proposal. If there's any questions, you can uh, contact Jessica and uh, well, anybody around the team, I'm sure, can help you get to the right people if needed. All right. So we have received a quarterly report for Hyperledger Indy. It came in a bit late. There is no rush. I saw that a few people, a few among us had the chance to look at it. Nobody raised any issues yet, but I'm happy to carry that over to next week. There is no, I, you know, there's nothing in the report that, uh, re, that calls for some immediate action. So I'm very comfortable doing this. Let's just keep it to next week. Um, there are two main items for the agenda today. One is I would like us to make a decision with regard to the proposal to move the beef lab to a project. And then later we can talk about the common maintainers management policy issue. Um, regarding the first, I don't know how much people want to discuss and ask questions. Um, I saw, so following up on the TSC call last week, Hart posted on behalf of their team behind the proposal, a fairly extensive email trying to provide additional information and uh, answering some of the questions that had come up during the calls. <clears throat> and then Peter sent, uh, posted some slides yesterday uh, is Peter on? Yes, Peter, if you want, I can give you five minutes to go over your slide. There's really one slide. And uh, if you care to do that, uh, I can accommodate. But I really don't want us to spend too much time. I'd rather we focus on trying to come to a decision as a group. So and oh, if there's anybody is who has an urgent question, you know, before they can make a decision, obviously, if you have some still the need for clarification, you will have an opportunity to do that. So, Peter, you want to present your slides? So, I was just slide. posting those slides on behalf of Fujimoto's son. So, I'll forward your question to him. He's also in on this call right now. So, Rai, if you click on the latest slides link in front of you there, that will get you to the email from Peter. And there, there's the attachment. It's a very simple day. There's really just one slide. The first is the title. 
And so do you guys want to talk to this slide? Um, Shingo, would you like to say something? Yeah, he's got his hand raised. Oh, yeah. Yes, please, me? go uh, ahead, Shingo. Uh, thank you for the, uh, this is Shingo Fujimoto from Fujitsu. Uh, this slide is showing to the, uh, there's a response to the previous meeting, the request to you, we need to show the, uh, the use case, non-financial use cases, regular, uh, the Shinkeshan, simple use cases. So the, this one is showing to the, uh, the, uh, the, the token ledger and marble, uh, the ledger will be, uh, re, uh, the integrated as a, uh, one single service. And actually, uh, the the main member of the BIF agreed to uh, provide this uh, the example as an implementation as a example of the BIF. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the you will see that this one is in few uh, the, uh, months later uh, the workable. Uh, the, that is our, our only the same for the this slide. Thank you very much. I'd like to take uh, your questions. All right, thank you. So, I don't know if people needed that, but hopefully it adds to the picture. So, now, with in mind the fact that, you know, I'm going to call for a vote on whether we should approve this uh, proposal to create a project out of the, the beef lab or not. Um, does anybody have any questions for the team here? Uh, Arno, this is Angelo. I have more a question for you, actually, for the other TSC members. And this I have seen also in the in the in the the the, the emails that are in the thread of emails. Uh, um, I don't remember who was questioning uh, which are uh, the actual criteria that T, the, the the TSC uh, will use to make uh, to make a decision on such a on such a move. So I, I would like to ask the others, all the other TSC members, uh, about which are the criteria that we should use to evaluate this uh, this, this issue. Because I, I'm a bit confused. So it's depending on this criteria, I, I might take a decision. Uh, I will definitely. I'm, to me, I'm not convinced by the, the 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 proposal. But depending on the criteria, I might change my 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 decision. All right. So I, you know, we don't have. To, to directly answer your question. We don't have a document that defines the criteria. What we do have is uh, what is called the HIP, Hyperledger Improvement Proposal, which is a template document that people are being asked to fill out that provides what was considered to be key information to make this decision. Um, and, and they have done that. This is what's linked from the, the agenda the first uh, sub-bullet blockchain integration framework beef proposal. That's the uh, Google document that follows a template that provides, you know, as I said, key pieces of information. Um, this template was put together at the beginning of Hyperledger. Nobody has asked for this to be updated or questioned it. So that's what it is. Um, that's all we have. But, uh, you know, we have Chris here who has even more history on this than anyone else. If Chris wants to add something, I don't know. No, I mean, you, you, you pretty much said it. There really isn't, um, you know, it's kind of like the definition of obscenity. We'll know it when we see it. I don't know. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm still... I gotta say, Hart, I, I saw your note and I appreciate it, but I'm still, I looked again at all the use cases and they're coin. Coin, 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 coin. There are two non-coin use cases. And I'm still struggling, and maybe it's just my, I'm just not sort of getting it, but I still don't see what the difference is between this and Quilt. Sure. I mean, I'd be happy to explain that in more detail. Um, quilt is, is quilt is, you know, specifically using. Uh, it's using a very specific mechanism, I guess, to do 
uh, inter-blockchain transactions, right? Was the BIF is totally pluggable. Um, and I guess, again, in our document, uh, I guess we probably presented too many uh, token applications. Uh, but the point is it's flexible. You can do anything you want. So um, is there something, uh, so hard, I, 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 can I, yeah. Can I just add something real quickly? Sure. Um, if, so Chris, my interpretation of this is um, Quilt is a protocol about a very specific, very specific kind of transaction and a very specific kind of asset. Um, BIF is really an SDK. Um, it doesn't tell you what a good application is, um, but it does allow you to create these applications that, that involve transactions that span blockchains. So when I read it, I read it as an SDK for building something. Some of those some things are going to make sense, and some of them are not going to make sense. But, but the SDK itself is something that, that I think is pretty valuable. So, I mean, again, <clears throat> um, uh, as, as I've said a number of times before, I think that if we were going to try to come up with an SDK that could be portable from one platform to another, um, then you can write clients that they're, they don't care what's behind the curtain, right? Um, the APIs are all exactly the same. And the implementation of how you do consensus and, you know, whether you use a Merkle tree or whatever, irrelevant, right? Um, <clears throat> so from that perspective, I mean, I, it's, it's the one place in our architecture that I think makes sense to start working on. But I think that we need to walk before we can run. And so now we're putting together a SDK that you're intended to plug stuff into the back end. And I suppose that's one way of doing it. But I would think that it would be better if we can come up with the model that says, if this is our data model, if this is our model for how transactions are made, then we should be working to get the frameworks to adopt that model. Um, rather than try and shoehorn in things that don't necessarily fit. Um, <clears throat> if you follow my, my meaning. Yeah, I mean, think, it, it, what, what do you mean by shoehorning in things that don't fit? When you have to build in a shim an implementation of a driver that's going to make the back end calls, there's an assumption made that the models are basically uh, maybe not isomorphic, but they're they're um, uh, extraordinarily similar, <laughs> right? You you, you you it's you're going to have a situation I think where you're going to be trying to adapt a platform and it's SDK or, you know, it's, it's protocol, it's, it's, it's APIs are going to be a square peg for a round hole. Are you uh, there's Peter, would you? There's a big difference between the kind of SDK that uh, Chris talked about before, which was to have some kind of like common SDK that allows you to, you know, have uh, plug your, your application to different networks. And this actually, implies that you're talking to multiple networks at the same time, right? Doing these kind of transactions across networks. Well, that's I a think that's a secondary thing. thing. I think that comes afterwards. I just, I don't know. I mean, look, um, I, I, and I said this before, I said this in the, the thread part that you, that you cited, in your note, and the last comment I made was, I still think that it makes sense to make sure that everybody, all the maintainers and the contributors to these various projects are essentially bought into the same model. And I don't know that we're there. I don't know that we're even trying. Um, so, you know, I guess sure, um, but uh, I just think we're, it's yeah, I, I agree with you totally that the best possible solution would be if everyone agreed to a common data model. Um, but I'm not sure this is even a reasonable thing to ask within Hyperledger, much less 
uh, with much less outside of Hyperledger, like, you know, a lot of the business applications that say, you know, Accenture does involve Corda. Um, are we going to be able to get Corda to collaborate on a data model with us? Are we going to be able to get Ethereum to collaborate on a data model with us? Again, I hear what you're saying. And yet at the same time, I'm also very mindful of the fact that the integration happens at the application level, not the blockchain level. And so uh, it, it, in a sense, right, it but, almost doesn't well, even matter what the underlying data model but, is. But, but one way to think of this, Chris, is that this is your application level SDK. I mean, yes, it's not sitting on the client, but but it's this is how you build your application. And and the criteria that I would ask you for is not, is it a perfect data model? The question is really, is it useful? Is it useful for building applications? And and I, I think the reality is we're not gonna have consistent data models. Um, it's unrealistic to believe that, that there's gonna be uh, a, an effort among the maintainers to coordinate that kind of activity. So the question is, how do we get usefulness out of this? Um, you've got two companies that are well, sponsoring Well, but that. I mean, uh, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, Nick. And yet at the same time, if, let's say I'm, I'm trying to do the food uh, interoperability uh, use case that's in the, the white paper. Um, uh, let's assume I'm doing that and organization A's blockchain uses GS1 data model and organization B's uses Edifact. That's the application yeah. data model. These things are not the same. There are some ontologies that try to make them somehow or other somewhat interoperable, but that's a huge thing. It's not just some smart contract. It's it's a whole right. Well, to, to go farther on that, from the identity side, we've learned that having different data models is actually a, a big advantage and one of the drivers behind having separate chains. So it's not about just telling everyone they have to follow the same data model. <coughs> And so this adapter type approach has a lot of business value and application value because it allows you to have loose coupling between the ledgers while still having some sort of you know, agreement between the two systems about how translation between one and the other has to occur. And so it, you, um, there are ways of making it so you can validate the other ledger state natively on your chain. I think some of those have, are, are stronger from a trust architecture standpoint. But it's clearly there's business need for this as a as a solution with the companies we're seeing sponsor it, and having this kind of tool set to make those types of adapters gets us closer to those steps that I think are farther along in kind of how we evolve this in terms of interoperability going forward. And and I don't think the intention is to solve every one of these data model problems. I mean, you're, Chris, you're pulling out something that's an extreme example it may be common but it's extreme the question isn't can we solve all problems the question is it is it useful for solving some problems or maybe enough problems to justify being a project and and yeah. and i think and follow, that's probably the case sorry yeah so to follow up on that i i wanted to keep and uh, try to give some answers to to angelo's questions about you know what are the criteria I mean, the kind of information we've been looking at before to try to assess whether, you know, uh, we should approve a pro project proposal like that were things like, of course, you know, does that fit within Hyperledger? That's an obvious one. But beyond that, it was like, is there enough support to make it a viable project? And I think, you know, having two companies was always considered to be a good sign, which is the case here. And... Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, do we think this is a viable project or is it, you know, does it look viable enough to, uh, to be worthy of investing uh, Hyperledger resources supporting this project, you know, beyond what is afforded to a lab, right? That's, that was the whole idea of lab. They are very cheap to, to have. Uh, projects are more expensive. They they are under the governance of the uh, the TSC, and there is you know they have all these uh, resources allocated to it in terms of the IT infrastructure, but also you know communication and and so on. So like the security audits, all these things cost money, and that's why there's a difference between just a lab and a project. So hopefully that helps a little. 
Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think the same. And I was thinking to myself, I was, I was asking my, to myself, why, why then Hyperledger Fabric Private Chain Code is still, um, is still a lab project? So it has a massive uh, amount of source code. So uh, it has sponsored by two companies, uh, IBM Intel. Um, it, it's very, it's full. So there is code there. You can run something. So, but this project is just a proposal. It's sorry if, uh, if I say that, but it's very questionable because it doesn't say how to solve the huge problems. I mean, the fact that you, in the answer, you say, oh, yes, you can plug privacy. Thank you. That's, uh, of course, that's a tautology. Uh, we can plug privacy, but how? I mean, you, uh, that's a hard problem. Uh, how to make, pri how to, to, to realize privacy, you know? That's the hard problem. So, uh, to me, if we accept this to become a project, uh, maybe there are also other projects that needs to become automatically um, projects, other labs, uh, projects that needs to become projects automatically. So that, this was my, 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 my this is personally what struggles me to understand. So either we set criteria precisely, uh, there is also in terms of uh, a code availability. So for example, it's important that there must be something running that they should, this, they have to show, we have to pretend them to show, it. Give, give us something. You, you say that this is useful. Give us right. something that we can evaluate and say, oh yeah, you, you gave us something uh, that uh, is showing, it's promising, it's going this direction. Notice also that Fabric Private Chain Code, now of course, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm from IBM, so maybe I, I'm, I, I'm definitely biased, but there's also a publication accepted at the, at the conference, so the, the, the work has been also peer reviewed, which I don't see for this, uh, for, for this project. Okay, but Angelo, so le, le, let me say one thing first. The private uh, chain code, you know, there's not been a request made to the TSC to turn this into a project. And I think, in fact, if anything, it's going and to you go won't hear one. <laughs> not to distract, but I think the point was nobody said no to FPC. So saying that FPC isn't a project, therefore, this shouldn't be a project yeah. doesn't make logical. Exactly. That, that's beside the point. So let's leave that aside just for the sake of it. And then, the, you know, so then there is not going to be more specific criteria for you to make your decision. I gave you as much as I can. If anybody else has additional information, please go ahead and provide it. But if fundamentally, you know, if you believe there's not enough, well, then you shouldn't vote in favor of it. That's just the way it is. And by the way, this is a lab, right? So, you know, people may decide, you know what, it's not, it, they haven't convinced me that it's, uh, they have made, they have enough to be worthy of a project yet. And we can say, you know what, keep making progress as a lab first, show me that you can actually achieve something, and then we'll talk again about making it a project. That's a reasonable position as far as I'm concerned. So, and, and at this point, it's up to every one of us to make their own call. So uh, let me turn again to everybody before I call for a vote. If, does anybody have any other questions they need to an get answered as much as possible before they make that decision? Uh, this is Troy. Um, I, I was putting into the chat that I think the difficulty is evaluating um, earlier projects or projects that have less sponsors. So the, the decision seems to become very subjective. Um, and I haven't really resolved that um, issue, at least for me. Yeah, no, but that's true. And, and I mean, I've pointed that out before and it, I think Hart was frank enough and he said, you know, if anything, hopefully this will make it more visible and attract people to the table. One of the challenges they have is they want to create this like super API kind of, kind of thing and they want to have as many people involved early on as possible so that they don't have to redo it as people become aware and interested and then come in and say, yeah, your API is good, but not quite right for me can you make it so and so and so and every time they have to refactor everything so i can understand where they're coming from but that's the way it is so any other questions or remarks otherwise i can make I'd a remark. Like to talk. Please. i think 
um, looking at at this as a portfolio decision, which is not something that we that we necessarily do, but uh, we feel like we need more kinds of projects that that look at integrations or, or look at ways to stitch things together, and so it should never just be a, a blank check that if you if you're trying to solve that problem, you get in as a project. Um, but we don't have a lot of strength in that area right now, and we could say that uh, we do have quilt, but I would not put all of our eggs into the quilted basket uh, to make some metaphors. Uh, that's all I have on that. All right. Anything else? Any other wise comments? Well, I'll just try again. The other comment I made is I, I still see struggle with this uh, labs designation. And you know this Boolean category of labs versus projects seems to be a bit problematic. I'm interested in that. Why is that a problem? Um, it, it just seems that maybe project or, or, or lab projects are seeing an advantage from being a lab. And I, I guess the key concern I saw in the proposal was they don't want to just be a lab. So I, I, I don't know what to do about that, but it just seems like a a problem. Well, we can ask them what, why, you know, again, hot, maybe you can speak for the, or Tracy, for the group on that one. What's the primary motivation at this point in time to try to move from a lab to a project? Uh, Tracy, would you like to talk or should I? Uh, I mean, I think it really does come down to the community, right? Um, getting the the wide diverse set of opinions and contributions to the community that maybe we're not getting currently as a lab um it feels to me like some people on this call are saying labs are bad um which i i, I don't think is the case right or, or they're lesser in some way um i think it's just a way to start begin or to start uh, building that community but uh you know, I think there's a, obviously, you know, we weren't getting this kind of discussion before we brought it up as a project proposal, right? We weren't getting the opinions, the people looking at it in a, in a different way um, un, until it was brought up as a proposal. So, uh, yeah, I, that's, I guess, where my brain is right now. And, and Hart, please add to that. Yeah, I mean, another reason is we want to, we want to use the tools. Like, uh, you know, Peter and some people were talking about, you know, setting up basically their own CI CD. And, you know, we, it would be, you know, easier for us if we could just do that once uh, in Hyperledger and didn't have to like do it now and then, you know, do it later at, at some other status and change everything if we became a project. Uh, so, so some of the tooling is, is also a reason, but um, yeah, I think Tracy said it well. All right, so with that said, I would like to call for a vote. So I um, would like to make the motion to call, to approve, because that's the proposal, uh, moving the blockchain integration framework lab to a project. This is Dan, I second. Thank you. Okay. So we're gonna call for a vote, right? Uh, Angelo? No, I'm against. Arno? Actually, I'm going to abstain. And I'll comment a little bit because it's not too common to abstain, but uh, I'm really torn. And, and on the one end, I feel like, yeah, this sounds like interesting enough that it might be worth a project. At the same time, I feel like a bit more work could be done in the lab, especially since there is two code bases, trying to show a little bit how you integrate those things already would be a good first step. And I'm hoping that having raised this already as a proposal, will have given it more exposure and attracted more interested parties that you can actually at least achieve some of what you were trying to achieve by moving to, pro to project. Chris? Hmm. <clears throat> well, I guess I'll say okay. 
um, I want to say non-committal or something. I don't know. I, right. I, I, I'm not overly thrilled with it. I mean, I, I tend to be very skeptical about any integration, but um, I don't want to get in the way. Okay, Dan. Can I just say approve or do yeah. I have to? Sure. Okay. Okay. Gary. Uh, I don't know if Gary is let, let on. Let see if yet. I can get him off of uh, his other call. Heart. <laughs> oh, I have him. I have him on Slack. Hold on. He said on the chat that he, let's move on and then we'll see if he catches up. Hart. Yes. Mark. Uh, yes. I hope yeah. that we'll bring extra visibility and you know, that the team will welcome more input from a wider diverse audience. Nathan. Yes. Swatha. Yes. Tracy. Yes. Troy. Abstain for the same reason as I know. Um, so I was just chatting with Gary, who's still on the other call, and uh, he says he's not against it. So is that a yes? <laughs> Uh, yes, that's a, yeah. I, it, it's, it's, it's really yes, simple, like yes, no, or, or He says here, are we voting on the BIF? And he says, I'm okay with that. Seems like there's no harm. Okay, he's, yes, he's he chatted. Wrote, yes, guys, he wrote yes in the chat. Okay, so okay. we're good. That's it. Okay, so I think we're done. There's no objections. There's only approves and a couple of abstains. So therefore, the motion is passed. Did, did Angela object? Yeah, Angela voted against it, but. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yep, you're right. My bad. There's wow. one vote against it, so, but so that's done enough. So All right. it's not unanimous, but uh, the motion is passed anyway. Mazel tov. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay, congratulations. Let's move on. So I, I would like to continue the discussion. We started a little bit and I tried to uh, put a bit more uh, meat around the bones in uh, putting up together uh, an issue in the decision log and at least a uh, few existing policies regarding how the projects are maintaining uh, or managing their maintainers list. And there are variations for sure. The issue for me is, you know, in keeping with what we try to do with the common repository structure um, is, you know, trying to provide some consistency across the different projects. And to be clear, I don't mean necessarily that there is one policy that's very like, you know, uh, constraining and that's adopted by everybody. I think at least I would like to have some basic policy that would be the default for projects that do not have one and you know happy to adopt whatever it sounds reasonable and um, and then you know maybe it will influence some of the existing projects to have some to 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 align their policies their existing policies with that one but in any case I think it's bad that so many projects do not document how maintainers are being you know elected or selected and and, uh, and so at the very least, we should have some kind of documentation of how this is being managed at the project level. And so as part of that, we have to kind of define, you know, what are the key elements of a management policy that you would expect to find in, uh, in, in, that, in that kind of policy. And so at this point, I don't have a specific proposal again, I just started the, pro the, 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 you know, trying to gather information about what the current state is. I only found like a handful of projects that actually have one. So there are quite a few projects for which I haven't found any. I don't know if they have one. If you do, there's a list there. It's, you know, it's a wiki, you can update the page. And um, once we have gathered enough I think we can start putting together the elements that are common and maybe what is missing, what seems to be reasonable. And together we can kind of start building what seems reasonable, you know. And, and again, we don't have to decide this is the one uh, and only one, but uh, we can at least uh, 
of some common ground. So that's the premise, and uh, this is what I'm trying to achieve here. Um, I saw there are several people have actually started commenting on the on the the, the issue. Thank you for doing that. Um, I would like to open it to everybody to discuss and share what they think about this. No, no takers. I have to say, I will add, if you look at the list, in fact, there are three different ones, different policies. We have one for Bezu, which is actually, I have to say, whether you agree with it or not, it's very well written, very detailed, and they explain exactly the process they go through. Uh, Fabric has a pretty good one too. Sawtooth has a good one too, but then, you know, all the other projects are basically were built out of Sawtooth and they all share the same. And I don't mean to say it's not as good as the others. I just want to point out that in fact, we don't have so many different variations. We only have three different types of policies in the works today, in, you know, in, in use today, I should say. Yeah, I think so. This, uh, is, I this is Chris. Oh, sorry, Hart, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. No, you're good. Uh, okay, so I was just going to suggest that what really needs to happen here is that we get the maintainers of the various projects together like we did in October, and virtually, obviously, <laughs> and let them hash it out and come up with something rather than us telling them what it is. Does that make sense? No. Nope. Yeah, but we have a lot of us are maintainers too, right? Yeah, that's true, but not for every project. That's true. Okay, Hart. Yeah, I was gonna. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna think. I believe Gary commented on there, and it made a lot of sense um, that we have some kind of like core uh, policy that that people can adopt. I mean, sometimes we need like a, a slightly different policy. And I mentioned Ursa as an example there, um, where you know you want to sort of break out into like types of maintainer and other stuff like that. But I think Gary's suggestion was excellent. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that sounds like a good way to go. So is Gary on? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. So do you want to speak up to this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess what I was sort of proposing was it was kind of along the lines of what you said. I thought that maybe we could at least have a set of, you know, a couple of like standard types of policies, at least like what, you know, the um, how do you become a maintainer, right? Like, you know, what's the here's here's how you become a maintainer. Here's a retirement policy. Like there might be like maybe three or four different types, like I guess attributes, we can call them attributes or whatever that might be in the policy that people should have. They could no-op one if they, if they say, hey, we don't have one for that. But that was, the, that was the basic concept, right? Pick a couple of really standard things in a life cycle of being a maintainer and say, hey, this is what you should at least document um, how you do it, right? Here's how you become a maintainer. And it, you, know, you have to do X, Y, Z, and it requires a majority of the maintainers to vote uh, for um, uh, retirement of a maintainer or whatever we want to call for inactivity. We define inactivity as this amount of period. And again, it's a vote of majority. Um, it, you know, and maybe if there's something, if, if there's not maintainers available for something, I don't know, you know, we could, so, I mean, there's at least two, <laughs> how to become one and how to retire one or make one inactive, um, that at least people would, you know, that that would be kind of the standard that we would have. And you could pick your own, how you want to do it, but you would at least document those two, at least those two processes of, for the maintainer. There is right. one that's not uh, covered here explicitly, and I don't know if that was an oversight, uh, but um, Aroha does their maintainer elections in GitHub chats uh, in for the for the group, like Aroha-iOS-maintainers. They have a discussion there, and they vote there. Um, I know back when we had Garrett, you know, you, you could vote there. 
on it to make everything public. Um, and you know, you can make your argument, but yeah, I'm totally in favor of making this as explicit as possible. And right, do you know if there's a documentation about that process somewhere? No, I don't. Um, do we have anybody from the Roa project on who could speak up to this? So I think that, <clears throat> so what are we saying? Are we saying that we're going to have a framework that you need to have? How do you become one? What are your responsibilities? How are they removed or retired or whatever? Is that? I think what we're, what Gary was saying is that at least we should have, you know, a requirement that every project has a policy that's documented that, and that and and the list of items that you expect to be covered in the policy right. a, a framework right exactly yeah yeah um i'm good with that but um i guess coming up with that framework i mean well, maybe it's not that hard i don't think it is because we already have some so you know i'm happy to but take i, I a look. still think that you want some buy-in from the maintainers i don't think yes. we want to impose yeah, anything that's but I, i'm not i'm not hearing that that we have to have a unified one Just um yeah okay but i still would like to it, was, it it wasn't unified it was i think it was to say one you should have a policy here's some yeah. common policy stuff that we expect you to have and you can do it and we can you know like like our government likes to do we can make it a recommendation but not a mandate <laughs> Right. I, I, I like right. Chris's idea of, of bringing it to the maintainers, but I think, you know, we are a technical steering committee. We are not a technical, technical governing board. Um, so there's a balance we have to do there. Um, yeah. I yeah. can see us saying, here's some guidelines that we hope projects would follow and steer them in that direction versus thou shall have all of these covered. Yeah. Well said. I I I, I kind of like that. Um, and are we also making a recommendation as to where that policy is defined? I mean, as we see there's a number of different places here. Um, well, it's for it's for us to decide. <laughs> Personally, Chris, you like I the name file. I actually kind of like the basic MD? approach. I, I actually kind of like the basic approach, to be honest. To have it in the maintainer's file? Yeah, I like that. I think at least having a link from there, if it's not there, is, a, is an obvious place you look for. Another thing worth noting about our maintainer policy um, is we also do our governance on GitHub. If you want to add someone, you do a poll to the maintainer's MD. And the discussions and the votes are in the GitHub comments. So it provides a semi-permanent yep. record for it there too. So we're kind of like a Roja in that sense. Fabric does the same. Um, yeah, because it's the easiest, it was the easiest way to get a voting mechanism <laughs> and, a, and an audit log, as you said. Yep. <laughs> okay, so at least we could point that out as a way to do it, right? And that might influence those who don't have a way yet and they're like, how do we do this? Rather than reinvent the wheel every time, they might say, hey, that sounds like a reasonable way, let's just do this. And then we at least get some kind of, you know, harmonization across the projects. I, I really believe that a lot of the disparity we have, the variations are more accidental than, you know, intended. It's just because there is no single way to do it or not even a recommended way. So people say, oh, we should do this. Let's invent a way. If we even showed one way as a possibility, I think we would, people would naturally adopt it, at least for new projects that don't have one. So I'm going to suggest that uh, I'll take a stab at creating a PR against the TSC repo. And uh, we can review that for the next go round. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And I mean, to get back to uh, Chris's point about getting the maintainers involved, I agree. And I think once we have at least the beginning of a, an answer, we can definitely, you know, highlight it to the maintainers 
uh, to send an email to the maintainers list and tell people, hey, we are working on this. It will impact the way you work. <laughs> so you might, you know, if you care, please comment on the proposal. And so we can include them in the process. Speaking of the, the, the Hyperledger repo, Right. I know you were working on this for the uh, the document, the governance document we're supposed to start putting together. Any mm -hmm. updates on this? The repo exists. I would I would defer to Brian on that. Yeah, that's that's uh, on me. No progress on that yet. Okay. All right, so I think anything else we want to add to this uh, question? I think we have a plan. Thank you, Tracy, for volunteering. If nobody else has anything to say on this yet, let me ask if there's anything else somebody wants to bring up before we close the call. We have 10 minutes, and I don't think anybody minds closing 10 minutes early. I'm happy to do so, but. If you have a burning need to share something with the TSE, now is your chance. <laughs> all right, if not, then I'm going to call it. So thank you all for joining and uh, we'll talk again next week.